Part 1 You will hear a conversation between two students about buying a used car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the Student Union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for 10 years. I'm just the third owner and my mother had it before me. So we know it's history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it, unfortunately. It's been a good car. You want $1,500, is that right? I was asking $2,000, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um, well, I finish classes at 6 o'clock. How about straight after that? Say, 6.30? Great, I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, Turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number 88 on the right. So it's 80 Princess Street? No, it's 88 Princess Street and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. OK. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam and tells him about the car. Hi Sam. Hey Jan, what's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up. Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So what kind of car are you looking at? It's an 85 Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking $1,500. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look? At about 6.30? Sure, I'll come, but I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea.
But won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for eighty dollars, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at six thirty. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every fifteen minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. Okay, great. See you at six outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a travel agent discussing a holiday booking with two customers. Look at questions eleven to thirteen. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Good morning. We'd like to book a holiday for July, please. Certainly. Where did you have in mind? Oh well, we haven't thought a lot about it really. We'd just like to go somewhere hot, you know, and it must be in July. I see. Well, let's get the dates cleared up first, then we can see about availability. What part of July were you thinking of? Oh well, you see, we have slightly different holidays. I've got the whole month except for the last five days, so I could go from the first to the twenty-sixth. But my friend here doesn't start until the seventh, so I suppose it will have to be the middle two weeks, really. Yes, but I've got to be back before the twenty-third. Okay, now let's find a destination. Before the tour continues. Look at questions fourteen to twenty. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. Any preferences? France, Italy? Oh, not France. We went there last year, and it was absolutely packed with teenagers, making noise and getting drunk all the time. Yes, it was terrible. We definitely want somewhere quieter this year. Well, of course, it depends more on the resort rather than the country. There are resorts in every country which cater for the family or the slightly older person. They're usually a shade more expensive, though, as you might expect. Oh well, we don't mind paying a bit more if it means more peace and quiet, do we? Definitely not. It'll be well worth it. All right, let's have a look at what we've got on the computer. July. Was it ten or fourteen nights you wanted? Oh, the fortnight, please. Right. Well, let's start with Italy. Um, we've got fourteen nights, bed and breakfast in Sorrento for three hundred and forty-five pounds from Manchester on the fourteenth. Or we've got. No, wait a minute. That's no good for me. We wouldn't get back till the twenty-eighth, and I've got to be back at work before that. Ah, yes. 
Um, how about Sweden? Two weeks, half board. How much would that be? That would be five hundred and forty pounds from Manchester again. Well, five hundred and forty. Ah, that seems too much. Well, madam, there's a surcharge for the airport, and it has a five-star hotel. Oh well, it's a bit over our budget, really. All right, let's try somewhere else. How about Portugal? Oh, that sounds great. We've never been there before, have we? Let's see now. We've got fourteen nights in Albufeira, half board from Gatwick, for three hundred and eighty-five pounds. Albufeira. Oh, wait a minute. Did you say the flight was from London? That's right, from Gatwick. Oh well, we'd prefer a flight from the north somewhere, Manchester perhaps, or even Glasgow. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for twenty years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university? Even with the change in your everyday duties, I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best. To not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, 
but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America, to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nittick, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> an average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone, so there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next 10 days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of 2001. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nittick. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to talk about the changes to our leisure time, and I'll start by talking about lifestyle changes over recent years for women. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to talk about the changes to our leisure time and I'll start by talking about lifestyle changes over recent years for women. As we all know, the wife and mother of the family has traditionally been responsible for organising and completing household tasks for the family. However, particularly over the last decade or so, we have seen a greater number of women continuing to work after marriage and returning to work after having children. This has significantly reduced the amount of time available for household chores. The result is that nowadays the majority of people own and regularly use products such as dishwashers or microwaves. 
The modern family often considers hours spent on cleaning and cooking as a waste of valuable time, and generally we are all interested in finding ways of reducing the number of hours we need to devote to such tasks. While washing machines have long been thought of as necessities by families, nowadays so too are microwaves and dishwashers. These goods can drastically reduce the amount of time we need to spend running our home and increase the amount of time available not only to go to work, but also to spend on leisure pursuits. As society develops and we become richer, we put more value on our leisure time and our possessions. The richer a society, the more demanding it becomes. People are no longer happy to work long hours for little return. Expensive holidays, expensive clothes and cars all become more important the more materialistic the society in which we live. Acquiring things and joining the race of acquisition means that modern society spends a lot of time and money purchasing unnecessary goods. Although expensive and persuasive marketing techniques are partly responsible, the demand for such goods often comes from young professionals. Those with the money to endlessly upgrade things simply because a better model is made available. Our obsession with the newest and best products available, while good for the economy, can also have a negative impact on the environment. It is not appropriate to overproduce appliances and overuse electricity to keep these unnecessary appliances operating in our homes. We often forget about the damage we have done to and continue to do to the environment. Others opposed to the overuse of appliances and technology also argue that from a social point of view, over-reliance on gadgets means that people are losing the ability to be creative. Traditionally, it was considered an enviable skill to prepare meals night after night for our families. Nowadays, women are more likely to gain approval from others for their success in their careers than their ability in the kitchen. Along with microwaves have come ready-cooked meals, pre-washed vegetables, and our reliance on takeaway food when we are too busy to cook it ourselves. While there are obvious advantages and disadvantages to our increasingly active buying behaviour and changing wants and desires, it is likely that our desire to purchase labour-saving items will continue. So it is therefore inevitable that production of such goods will increase. We can only hope to educate ourselves and our children to buy goods we need, not just goods that are available and we must also consider their environmental impact. In short, moderation is the most important word for the future. I thank you very much for coming today and listening. That is the end of part four.